Oh, well, we'll miss you. Well, it looks you. like it's six, six o'clock and it looks like we have a quorum. So um, start the planning commission meeting for July 28, 2021. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the City of Tucson Planning Commission. My name is Chuck Martin. I'm the chair of the planning commission. The responsibilities of this body are to advise the mayor and council and the planning and development services department on the adoption of long range plans, policies, specific plans and regulations that affect land use and development. Uh, will staff call the roll please? Uh, yep, um, Chair Martin. Here. Um, Commissioner Gast. Here. Commissioner Fink. Here. Commissioner Cassidy. Here. Commissioner McBride Olson. Here. Commissioner Pafford. Here. Commissioner Young. Here. Commissioner Saylor Brown. Here. Commissioner Wellett. Absent. Commissioner Ortiz Pino. Here. Commissioner Lucia. Here. Commissioner Schwartz. Um, absent. Uh, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, next item is item number two to approve the legal action report for June. Was it 16th? Did I write that down wrong? 2021. Entertain a motion for approval of the legal action report for June 16, 2021. So moved. I have a second. Second. Who was that? Sorry. It was Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, any discussion? All those in favor of recommending the item to Mayor Council say aye. 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 Anyway, any opposed say nay. Adam carries. The next item is uh, number three public hearing um, additional dwelling units. UDC text amendment. Uh, can the staff please provide their presentation? And could I remind everybody to turn off their microphones unless you're speaking? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commission. We appreciate it. Um, so, uh, item number three is uh, the accessory dwelling unit um, unified development code uh, text amendment. Um, and this is a public hearing um, for this. So with that, uh, we'll start here. So um, what we have in front of you tonight um, is a proposal to allow for um, accessory dwelling units uh, within the city of Tucson. Um, this would be an amendment to the Unified Development Code um, to allow these. Um, and the basics of that proposal is to allow for one per residential lot, um, a limit to maximum size uh, to 10, 000, to 1,000 square feet um, on lots that are greater than or equal to 7,000 square foot, or 750 square feet on lots that are less than 7,000 square feet. Uh, this is a revision um, based on public feedback uh, compared to what we had come to you with last time, um, which was just a flat rate of 1,000 square foot maximum. Um, additionally, uh, requires one parking space. Uh, there are waivers for proximity to transit, uh, bike route, um, and then a requirement for a cool roof um, for those accessory dwelling units. Um, this has been through an extensive public process uh, to inform the proposal that is in front of you right now. Um, we've held eight stakeholder meetings. We've had seven public meetings with 400 plus attendees. Uh, we have seven, we've had 78 co online comments. That was prior to the uh, proposal being released. Um, then when the proposal was released, uh, we put out a survey and we've had 275 survey results to date on that. Um, we've had mostly positive results from the, from the community. Uh, that number's actually gone down a little bit because of new uh, surveys, but it, uh, high 60s uh, either strongly or somewhat agree that the proposal will benefit the community. Um, some of the concerns uh, related to the following, uh, ADU size, uh, owner occupancy has been a big topic, uh, historic preservation, short-term rentals, uh, affordability, um, and parking related to these. So um, that's kind of what, what we'll be talking about. Um, so just to kind of go back to the beginning of this 
um, and where we started. So on November 17, 2020, the City of Tucson Mayor and Council held a study session to begin the process to revise the Unified Development Code to allow for these accessory dwelling units. Um, at that meeting, um, they provided the following direction. The staff, I'm just going to read this so we uh, at least are all on the same page and the starting point here. Um, initiate amend an amendment to the Unified Development Code, which would define and permit accessory dwelling units. Identify the zones where they are appropriate and create development standards re uh, regulating unit size, height, maximum lot size, maximum lot coverage, setbacks, parking requirements, and other relevant aspects in order to promote this accessible and attainable housing option, no matter that's compatible with existing neighborhoods. Uh, to begin in a public outreach on the amendment, uh, inclusive outreach to hear a variety of constituents, uh, which uh, often are underlooked communities and communities of color, low income communities, renters, homeowners, and stakeholders. So a diverse group of people. Um, and then they told us to return to mayor and council with a proposed amendment by, by June. Um, it is now July, we are um, a little behind, um, but, uh, but we are working through the process here. Really. So uh, what is an accessory dwelling unit? Um, an accessory dwelling unit is an independent housing unit uh, with its own kitchen, uh, bathroom, living, and sleeping space. Uh, uh, sleeping space. Um, so a kitchen is really the main differentiation between an ADU or accessory dwelling unit and a guest house or sleeping quarters that we are currently allow in all of our zones. Um, one term that is, you know, we, it, it is known as, you know, other things like casitas, mother-in-law units, granny flats, uh, backyard cottages, carriage houses. Uh, we didn't include tiny home here um, just because it can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, a lot of times it's on wheels and that's not this. This is on permanent, uh, this is on a permanent foundation and it's a permanent building. Um, one thing to note that this is really already a common housing type in Tucson. Um, so historically these have been allowed by the city up until 1948. Um, when the zoning code came in in 1948, um, these were actually, they went through and they banned these, um, but they were allowed up to them. So they are a historic kind of housing type that we've had in the city and you see in older neighborhoods because of that. Um, and it, it is, you know, something that is um, allowed in other communities in, in Arizona um, and it's becoming more popular and the regulations are changing as we kind of, as people see these and they become more available. So um, there are different types of accessory dwelling units. So accessory dwelling units can be attached, uh, detached. Uh, they can be a separate space within the primary house. Um, it can potentially even be a basement. Um, we don't have many of those out here. So um, you don't <laughs> probably won't be seeing many of them, but that is a possibility. And we see those in other communities um, where they do have lots of basements. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, one thing that we um, that came up in the last meeting um, related to accessory dwelling units was there was a bit of a discussion, um, Commissioner Fink uh, uh, brought this up, just kind of related to other communities and where our proposal stands compared to other communities. Um, so we did, uh, we went and looked, one, we, we went and looked to make sure that there, if there were any updates to some of the ordinances since we initially did the research, we made those updates, um, but also we looked at some additional communities. And you see really a range of, of different things um, as far as these different communities. Um, so communities like Flagstaff um, and Durango have a smaller maximum size. Those are smaller communities as well. Um, so, you know, Flagstaff says basically 33% of the principal res uh, residents, but 600 square feet of gross floor area. Durango's 550, but then as you go up, you see Tempe, you know, shall not exceed 800 floor area. So that's the internal space, not the external space. So it'd be probably something more like 850. Um, and then Portland, they allow for, you know, 75% or of the living area or 800 square feet. Um, one interesting thing to note about Portland is the fact that they allow for two accessory dwelling units on each lot. So um, you could potentially have up to, you know, 1600 square feet of ADU space it could just it would just be in two units. Um, Minneapolis has an 800 square foot uh, regulation on internal and attached, but you can go up to 1,600 square feet detached gross floor area. Um, they do have a thousand square foot maximum footprint, which is kind of interesting. So they're almost you know kind of incentivizing people going two stories um, in order to reach that 1,600 square feet. Um, and then you know San Diego, Los Angeles, and Fairfax County all have 1,200 square feet for their maximum ADU size. Again, it runs the gamut. Um, it's based off of community input and things of that sort, 
Um, but we see that you know what we're proposing is pretty much in line with a lot with a lot of these and kind of in the middle of, of the communities that we see. Um, we also looked at you know building height. Um, these again are either by zone like we have in our 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 proposal or um, you know place like Flagstaff allows for 24 feet. Durango 18 feet, so you could have you know a shorter kind of two story ish building, um, Portland with 20 feet, 21 in Minneapolis, and then Los Angeles has two stories, uh, which is not really good code, if you ask me, because it's not clear, but that's what they have. Um, parking, uh, most places don't require additional parking. Some do require one off street parking space. Um, others are like Los Angeles, where they require one unless you're within one half mile of transit uh, near Carshore or in a historic district where it's more walkable. Um, occupancy, um, this is something that's really interesting because what we're seeing is that um, most of the ones that we've seen don't have an owner occupant requirement, some do, um, but we're also seeing changes in this. So uh, Minneapolis had an owner occupancy requirement, they've just recently gone back and gotten rid of that. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you in a bit when I look at numbers kind of related to this. Um, and Flagstaff actually just, um, just directed their their staff to go back and remove their owner occupancy requirement. What they're seeing is that um, what ends up happening is they it, it's really limiting the uh, the impact of uh, and the, the the amount of development that could potentially happen in housing that could happen related to these. And a lot of these are in areas that really do have a pretty big housing crunch. And this is one of the strategies that they're looking at um, for that. So um, one other thing we did want to bring up as well is the AARP model ordinance. And, and this is just to kind of provide a little bit of context as far as what we're proposing compared to what else is out there. Um, so this is the uh, AARP model ordinance. Excuse me, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, ADU size uh, for the model ordinance that they said, basically they say that it can be any size that is smaller than the primary structure. And then they make a recommendation um, if, there are, if there are smaller um, essentially dwellings. And they say, you know, maybe a maximum of 800 square feet when the primary dwelling is smaller than the ADU. So they don't really, they, they give you an option. Should there be smaller units on some of those? Um, what they've kind of, you know, what they've said with this really is that it, it, it becomes, um, with those small ones, it actually becomes a penalty uh, for those smaller units uh, related to it. Um, 25 feet in height, uh, they did have an option to limit it to the principal structure. So they said, you know, some communities may want to do that. Uh, they recommended four foot setbacks. They recommended no owner occupancy requirements. Um, the reason why they did this um, is because they, they listed financial institutions being reluctant to lend money, uh, make it difficult to sell a home, potentially lease out a home uh, as a result of a divorce, a job transfer, death, anything of that sort. Um, and then they, they brought up this idea that single family homes can be rented out. So why are we biased towards ADUs related to our policy? They should be consistent. And that's really a lot of what they have here. Um, they talked about no off-street parking. Um, they have uh, they they believe that it's a serious inhibition to the construction of ADUs for two reasons really. First is the cost of creating an off-street parking space. Uh, it's a very high cost, and second is lot size, um, and it really limits uh, what you can do as far as the creation creation of parking spaces on certain lots. Um, the 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 final three things are kind of just related to. Um, consistency between your residential code and your accessory dwelling unit code and what you're doing. And they, you know, they talk about design standards and landscaping. They basically say, you know, they should be held to the same standards as the primary structure um, for consistency purposes. You shouldn't be regulating accessory dwelling units at a higher level than the primary structure. Um, and really that's what they say overall, regulation should be consistent between those two um, within the city. Um, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting read, I, you know, I, and, and it does, you know, provide that guidance um, for cities to do this. Um, the one last thing that I do want to bring up is just kind of related to limit, uh, is this idea of limiting discretionary processes, and this has to do with affordability. Um, so they, 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 they recommend that you limit discretionary processes, and those are things such as our special exception process, um, and things that really that re require an additional layer because it adds costs and it makes it much more complicated um, and really it really um, it, it, it affects 
basically homeowners who aren't used to the processes and it adds those costs. Um, so I will say that uh, if, you, if you look in your packet and you've read through kind of the letters, there is a letter from AARP. They have sent a letter um, providing support for our proposal um, and they have been a part of the process as, we, as we've been developing this. So one last thing before we kind of get into the proposal and some of the other stuff, um, I, I did want to go over um, just kind of numbers related to this. And this kind of came up in the last meeting to where a lot of concerns about um, this proliferation of, of accessory dwelling units and how it would impact the whole city and things of that sort. What we're seeing, we went and did research um, on different communities and how, and how many of these we're seeing being developed. And, and there are more. And these are communities that have had accessory dwelling unit ordinances in place for a while. Um, but even in 2019, you know, a, a place like San Diego with a population of 1.4 million only had 202 of, of these eight accessory dwelling units permitted. Um, a place like San Jose had 416. Uh, the, the, the outliers on here actually is really Encinitas with 103 out of 62,000. So they have 1.64 per thousand people in their community. But what, you're, what we're seeing is that there really aren't a huge amount of these being developed. They're helping and they're helping to provide housing for people and things of that sort. Um, but it's not, it, it, it's not this huge uh, kind of development boom that happens related to these. It's relatively small and dispersed. Um, one thing to note is that Minneapolis had 140 total between 2014 and 2019 prior to them changing their um, owner occupancy requirement. So they found that it was severely limiting people and their ability to build these because of financial reasons, because of um, just the fear of having to, of maybe having to sell and be mobile. Um, and they only really permitted, they only permitted 140 in those five years. They've since changed that. Um, we'll see what it looks like afterwards. Um, but, but, you know, in Tucson, we, we already allow for guest houses um, and we allow for second units on a portion of the uh, lots in the city. And we haven't really seen, um, you know, a, a huge amount of these built everywhere. Um, and usually it's just based on homeowner preferences. We're, we're seeing that ADUs will likely be similar and people will do it as they prefer to do so. Um, so after that, what are the reasons we're really here? And I'm, I'm just talk a little bit about this. Um, really the, the, the main reasons for this code amendment that we're looking at are, are to address you know, affordable housing um, in the city of Tucson. Um, so I, I, I wanna make the distinction a little bit and we'll talk more about it later between affordable housing um, capital A affordable housing, that's like section eight affordable housing and, and subsidized affordable housing, and just allowing for affordable options for housing. And a lot of it is related to really making, you know, trying to get people so they have options that don't require them to spend 30% of their income on housing costs and things of that sort. So figuring out ways to have more options for people that are relatively affordable for them. Um, so uh, we are looking at, so that's one of the reasons, um, housing options for seniors as, you know, senior population, it is growing, it's growing in Tucson and all over. Um, people want to age in place, uh, have caregivers. I, I, my mother-in-law um, will be retiring soon. It would, you know, it, we, we live on a double lot. It doesn't, this doesn't really affect us, but um, we, we are planning on having her, um, you know, we're going to build her a, a casita or something of that sort in our backyard for her to live in as well. So we can take care of her, but she can have that independent living space. Um, it's really to support this multi-generational households and multi-generational living. Um, and then climate action and resiliency. So um, as you know, may or may not know, mayor and council declared a climate emergency in September of last year. Um, accessory dwelling units are a way to promote one energy efficient housing, but infill development that really helps to support sustainable measures within the city. Um, these are things like increasing density to support transit, bikes, and ped, ped systems. Um, it's an alternative to sprawl instead of someone having to be, you know, having to go and, and buy an apartment on the periphery and a new green field, they could come and rent a, an ADU near services so they could walk, bike, do whatever. Um, it helps to support local businesses, a lot of different things related to climate action, resiliency, and how we support our city. So um, timeline for the ADU code amendment so far. Uh, we are at the July stage right now. We're in the public hearing. Um, this has been going since November. Um, we've had eight stakeholder groups, uh, two groups of public meetings, so seven of them. 
um, online survey and we've presented. Um, we are currently looking at September for the uh, public hearing um, as we move forward, dependent on how the meeting goes this evening. Um, give you a little bit of an overview of our stakeholder meetings as this was the group that really guided our, um, our process and uh, guided our proposal. So um, this was a group of approximately 40 members of uh, a, a variety of uh, community per perspectives and voices. So this group included neighborhoods, um, it included architects, planners, um, people from housing organizations, um, who deal with you know, nonprofits such as Pima Counts, Count, Council on Aging, Habitat for Humanity. Um, as I mentioned, uh, AARP was a, mentioned, was a member of, of this group, um, as well as uh, University of Arizona CAPLA. We had people from the uh, College of, Agri of, of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. Um, and then there were um, people from the development community to make sure that you know, this, you know, what we're doing is actually feasible or whatever. So, um, MPA, uh, Southern Arizona Home Builders Association, two center realtors were invited as well to that group. Um, so some of the things that we talked about, so we started back in December, um, started off doing background and goals for the code amendments, um, case studies from other communities, uh, and then we kind of came up with a project timeline for this and discussed that and how it works. I uh, came back in January, talked about current zoning regulations, what's allowed, what isn't, so those, uh, you know, sleeping quarters versus the uh, second unit. Um, and then we established goals and issues prioritization. I'll talk a little bit about that next. Um, ADU scenarios uh, in February. So we uh, brought on Opticos Design. Um, they helped us to develop some scenarios. They're the ones who uh, coined the term missing middle housing. They uh, have a ton of experience in this type of thing. Um, and then we talked about, you know, basically came out of that meeting and said, you know, it makes sense to maintain lot coverage and height regulations. Um, you know, we explored flexible stop setbacks and how we could do that. Um, and then we talked about ADU size restrictions and how to move forward with that. March, uh, we talked about owner occupancy, group dwellings, short-term rentals, um, how this should address those. Uh, came back in April, um, there was some concern about afford affordability of these units, especially with um, ballooning construction or con materials and construction costs. Um, talked about, you know, how, how to support um, this program or this, this, this amendment through other programs um, and then talked a bit about parking. Um, took all of that, brought it together, came back in May um, and reviewed a draft proposal with the stakeholder group, which we in turn took to the public. Um, in June, uh, review of the code amendment, of the draft code amendment. So we did the proposal first and then we drafted the code based on that proposal that we had presented to the public, um, talked about that, reviewed that. Um, which is what we presented to you at the last meeting. Um, we did hold a meeting on July 14th as well. Um, we went through and reviewed the Planning Commission study session feedback that we had with you, with you all, and then um, talked a bit about one, our maximum ADU size revisions that we are presenting tonight, um, along with talked about supportive programs uh, such as the affordable housing you know, programs, as well as the amnesty program. So the goals for the code amendments as prioritized by the stakeholder group, uh, these are them, these kind of guided the whole, uh, the whole process. Um, one was increase the supply of affordable housing, um, encourage flexible housing options for seniors who wish to age in place, support multi-generational households, support climate resilience and sustainable infill development that supports multimodal transportation, provide supplemental income to landowners and support local economic stability, allow diverse and flexible housing options within a neighborhood and promote mixed income communities and permit a housing style that uh, permit a housing style that already exists in our community and provide a legal avenue for upgrades that's the amnesty program um, and then re retain neighborhood character. Um, and those were our goals throughout. Um, there were issues that came up throughout that we, we were updating this every week. We were kind of talking about this as we we're doing it. Um, Issues to be addressed, um, appropriate districts and size and setbacks and, and site standards for ADUs. So basically things like building area, height, setbacks, making sure it's appropriate. Um, occupancy, uh, there was a lot of discussion about rentals, group dwellings, um, short-term rentals, parking and vehicular access, affordability and the cost of developing ADU. Again, I know costs have come down a bit. Um, Lumber is a little cheaper now than it was two months ago. It's still pretty high. Um, but that was, that was a big, big talk about this. How can we reduce costs elsewhere to offset that? Um, speculation and impact on property values and taxes, uh, privacy mitigation, enforcement and monitoring, um, sustainability and the heat island effect. This was a big, big discussion. 
um, building standards, and then historic standards and compatibility and making sure that, that we're not, um, not affecting historic districts uh, within this. So um, throughout the process, this is kind of what we've heard. Uh, we did, we had those eight meetings of the, of the 40 member group. We had 400 plus people at our seven public meetings, 76 online comments. And as of now, I know um, when we came to you last time, we had a little over 100 survey responses. We've received over 100 since then. Um, we'll go over the results of that with you here in a bit. Um, and it, it, we have, we've, we've heard mostly positive feedback to date, um, but there are concerns from the community as you've likely seen through your, um, through, through the comments that have been forwarded to you. Uh, a lot of those are related to the ADU size, which we, um, which we hopefully addressed. Um, impact on historic, uh, affordability, sustainability and urban heat island effect, and then only our occupancy requirements and how we're addressing that. Um, so with that, I will go through the draft proposal, talk a little bit about this, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. So um, this is one thing maybe, I know we presented this last time, um, so, but I, I do wanna reiterate here that um, what is currently allowed. So sleeping quarters, um, which is a, it, it is a housing type, um, are allowed on any residential zone parcel within a res with a residential use. Um, so these are um, structures that are limited to 50% 50 uh, the size of the principal structure. Um, they're only allowed to have a kitchenette. So you can have a microwave and a mini fridge, but you can't have a full uh, range and fridge and things of that sort. Um, they, they don't require any additional parking for these. Um, it does have a maximum building height of 12 feet. It's an accessory structure, at, it's a, at, or unless it's attached to a principal structure to where it can go up to the height of the principal structure. Sometimes it's two stories, sometimes it's not. Um, those are allowed everywhere currently. Um, so it, it, sometimes it could be less or more than, um, than what we're proposing. Um, if you had a 2,300 square foot home, you could have an 1150 um, square foot uh, sleeping quarters if you wanted. Um, second residential unit, um, also allowed, um, not on as many parcels uh, as, as, um, as obviously sleeping quarters or, or what we're proposing, uh, but these are allowed in R1, R2, and R3 zones. Um, there's no size limit. Uh, in R1, there needs to be a 25% difference. So, um, you know, if I had you know, I have a 1400 square foot home, um, it would have to be 25% larger, 25% smaller um, for that secondary store uh, unit. Um, full kitchen is allowed for these. Um, parking is required, so you have to park it to normal standards. Um, and the max building height is the same as the primary dwelling, which is whatever the zone allows. It's usually 25 feet. Um, just, you know, this came up at the last meeting. Um, just, you know, if we allow for secondary units, why are we doing accessory dwelling units? Well, uh, I, I, I want to just give you a couple numbers on the percentages of lots that we have that, that allow for this. So R1 allows for 20, basically 20.4% 20 of the lots in the city can build a second residential unit. So that's 13,000 lots out of 66,000 essentially. So only 20% for R1. For R2, um, about 60% can build that secondary unit. Um, and then R3, it's about 37% that can. So it's a significant amount of, of the parcels in the city that currently cannot build that secondary unit. And that's what we're going for here. We're, we're kind of filling that, that middle, middle ground between these two. So, um, so where can you build an ADU? Um, this was one of those things where we looked at it and um, pretty much we're, we're proposing all lots with a single family or two family residents can build one ADU. Um, we were initially looking at possibly zones, but um, it made more sense to just limit it to the residential use, similar to the sleeping quarters, because there are office zones and there are commercial zones that, that have residential properties on them, single family residential properties. So um, for, for existing homes and newer subdivisions, single family residents may have one ADU so long as it meets the lot coverage requirements for the zone. So um, generally that's 70%, that's, that is the general standard already um, and they would have to meet that. And then for newer subdivisions, um, they, would, they, they account for density calculations. So they count as 0.5 units um, for those density calculations. Um, related to building size for our proposal, um, we are, this is a change. 
Um, we are proposing 1,000 square feet maximum size ADU um, for lots 7,000 square feet or greater, um, and then 750 square feet maximum size for 7,000 feet square or greater. Um, we have, uh, we believe this allows for enough space for two bedroom units. Um, yet the smaller size, it, it really impacts, uh, it, it limits the impact on neighborhoods and surrounding properties. Um, it's simple for applicants to understand and for staff to administer. This is one of those things where we've heard over and over, try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and then, you know, we've, we've heard, you know, proposals for a percentage and we've seen them in other, other municipalities. Um, and what we've seen is that percentages tend to penalize, and I talked this earlier, people with smaller homes, um, and it's somewhat arbitrary. So um, it effectively acts as a small house penalty, um, and you limit that size on the lots where the primary dwelling is already fairly small, but have no impact on, on the primary dwelling when it's a big. Um, one thing I do want to note, kind of just related to this, is the fact that um, we, we do have a, a, a kind of structure for impact fees. And um, impact fee in, uh, incentive right now, it, it incentivizes keeping the size below 750 square feet. So below 750 square feet, um, you will pay $2,748 in impact fees. Um, above 750 square feet, it goes up to $4,310. So it almost doubles, not quite. Um, the impact fee. So there is an incentive, a financial incentive to keep it under that 750 square feet. Um, that was built into our impact fee structure when we did it a year ago with the intention of promoting accessory dwelling units that are, that are under 750 square feet. Um, so related to setbacks and development standards. Um, so uh, pretty much we're, there's no, that we're proposing to uh, make no changes to this, use the existing zoning. Um, changes the setbacks, uh, maximum building height, maximum lot coverage, all of those are there. We did those test studies. It seemed to work uh, where you can fit the ADUs on those lots. Um, but we do have the existing design development option that provides an avenue if you do need to reduce set, uh, setbacks on a site-by-site -site basis. Um, so I, I, we know we've had um, some concerns about building height, uh, potentially you know, going up to two stories on a lot of these and things of that sort. Um, we do have variable setbacks uh, within our code um, that help to mitigate the impact of height on neighboring properties. So it is two thirds the height. And I, I went out to my backyard and kind of measured it to get an understanding of really what that means. And um, so let's say you did want to do a 24 foot ADU with two stories, you would have to set it back 16 feet from that property line. It already, it already helps to mitigate. That's an additional 10 feet that, they would, that we would require you to do that. Um, so it, it, it's kind of built into how we have our code um, related to that. Um, and I, I think something we also do want to measure, mention here is just the fact that you know, for, for two stories, property owners can already build a second story on their current home, or they could build an addition um, that is that is two stories um, related to that. So they already have the ability to do this with an addition. Um, this would just be allowing for them to do that with an accessory dwelling unit or a detached structure. Um, building standards, uh, just wanted to mention, you know, ADUs must be built on a permanent foundation. We talked about this earlier. Um, and then it has to uh, comply with inclusive home design regulations, such as zero step entry, grab bars, et cetera. One thing I do want to mention just related to inclusive home design regulations and just accessibility. Um, you know, I, I, I initially was looking at a thousand square feet as a relatively large uh, accessory dwelling unit. Um, I, um, in conversations with one of my neighbors who has one that's a little over a thousand square feet, um, the reason, and it's a one bedroom unit, the reason why they needed that amount of space, one is they wanted, you know, it's for their mother. They wanted, it, they wanted it to be large enough for them, but she was in a wheelchair. And a lot of times when you have accessibility of these structures, you need to have additional space so people can move around. And so they have that accessibility within those structures. A 400 foot square foot structure wouldn't work for that type of thing. So that's part of the reason why, you know, you, you see that thousand square foot number there is to allow for enough space for some of that, for the, some of the accessibility issues that do come up when you have you know, seniors and aging in place and things of that sort. So um, related to privacy mitigation, historic design standards. Um, so HPC and, and our historic preservation zone and neighborhood preservation zone, those 
all remain in place. They, they supersede standards as it is. That's how overlays work. So um, this would have really no, no impact on those. Um, I, I, I know there's a bit of concern um, related to National Historic Register districts. Um, you know, I, it, it's, it's one of those things where we, we the things that really delist a um what well, well, first of all I, I will say that the proposal does not allow for a detached structure in the front of the building I just want to make that clear it doesn't allow for that um it there are you know in talking with our historic preservation officer there are cases where you could potentially build one in the front and if it still allows for the original building to stand tall and it would be fine and it wouldn't delist it it may um but we don't we aren't allowing for that with our proposal um, we uh, we have been in conversations. We've uh, shared our proposal with SHPO. We have been in conversations the whole time with our historic preservation officer. She doesn't think it's going to have much, if any, impact on this. Um, she stressed that it's a cumulative thing on how things are 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 um, how, how properties end up being delisted, um, and that you know ultimately the things that really delist these properties are solid walls that are over 48 inches in front of contributing structures. Um, and it's not really, it wouldn't be like the development of an accessory dwelling unit behind the historic structure. Even if the structure were taller um, it really, and visible from the right of way, it, it really shouldn't have that issue. Now, if they um, put a wall in front and they stuccoed the building and changed the windows and then put an ADU in back or on the side, maybe that, that, could, that could definitely be enough to do so. Um, but it, it just a, a loan and an accessory dwelling unit uh, wouldn't, wouldn't do that um, related to this. Um, so, uh, and I, one of the things that I, I went and did a, did a review of a lot of the nomination forms and inventory forms in my neighborhood, um, and there's one in my neighborhood that has a wall that is built off the side of the building, has a pool behind that wall um, on it, and it's in the side and the front, and, and they changed the windows, yet it was still approved by SHPO as a contributing structure. So it, 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 there, it, it takes a lot to delist something. Um, and it is a cumulative effect of lots of things happening to a property over time. Um, related to parking, uh, one parking space required per ADU requirement um, may be satisfied through on-site or on-street parking. Um, and then we're looking at, uh, you know, that requirement being waived based on proximity to transit or really we're saying enhanced bike routes, not bike boulevards necessarily. Bike boulevards are one of them, but something like mountain would also be included in that. Um, parking may be accessed from alleys per the UDC regulations, so you have to have stable ground so there's not dirt going all over the place or that it's actually, you know, you can drive your car back there. Um, and then um, the parking requirement for sites with 5 plus uh, is really only triggered through on-site parking. It's not triggered um, if you get your parking waived or you have on-street parking. So the, the concern was that, you know, you'd have a home with um, four bedrooms and then they build a one-bedroom ADU. They don't have to park it yet they have to completely rearrange all of their parking um, because of that. And that, that's one thing that we are, um, that, that, that we is not, it would not happen. Um, I think the, uh, the, 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 what we're trying to do here is trying to reach a balance between mitigating potential parking issues while not requiring parking when it's not needed. That additional cost, as we were talking about with the AARP um, model ordinance uh, on this, um, by requiring that one parking space uh, and the ability to waive this, we think we have achieved that balance. Um, I do want to note that um, the city also has a parking permit program. So in neighborhoods, especially some of those historic neighborhoods that are near downtown or in Midtown, um, we have the ability to utilize that parking permit program. We've been in contact with Park Tucson on this um, to help mitigate some of those potential problems for on-street parking and problems in those high-use areas. Uh, we, my, where I live, I'm close to the university. Um, there's a bit of on-street on parking. Um, we have a parking permit uh, for my block and it mitigates that issue for us and it works pretty well. Um, requiring on-site parking that is uh, necessary for an unneeded. So one, one last thing is just requiring on-site parking for unneeded, unnecessary. It only adds to unneeded impervious surface and increase those costs. Um, ADU occupancy, this has a, been a big conversation. Um, we are not proposing any occupancy requirements um, and the occupancy of ADUs must comply with our group dwelling or uh, regulations. We do wanna stress that it still has to uh, meet the group dwelling or regulations. Um, so the reason why we're proposing is I talked a bit about it earlier, 
owner occupancy requirements make the financing of ADUs more difficult. Um, they limit appraised values of properties with ADUs. Uh, should should lenders uh, for lenders should they need to foreclose? Um, there was a study, uh, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, that went through and looked at properties with ADUs. More than two thirds of those were owner occupant owner occupied, even without owner occupancy mandates. So most of these that you're seeing are owner occupied. Um, proposed limitations on this. Uh, 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 on the, the continuation uh, doesn't really affect the group dwelling ordinance, um, even though I know that has been a concern. Um, and we're seeing this in smaller communities, but we're also seeing even the smaller communities go back and look at changing this, uh, like we're seeing in Flagstaff um, for that. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at with this. We did want to talk a little bit about short term rentals. Um, I know that is also a concern. We are severely limited by the state on what we can do here. Uh, we know there is a program in Phoenix. Uh, that program in Phoenix, generally, it has a registration that they require. They require you to register on the website um, and have your information on there, um, as well as they have some behavioral um, aspects to it. Uh, and that is allowed by the state. Um, beyond that, there really isn't much allowed by the state. Um, we here currently do um, require uh, them to register their ADU with our business and get a business license for it. So we have that information. Um, additionally, uh, you know, we have our red tag ordinance, which is very similar to their behavioral um, kind of aspect of, of their short term rental uh, a or Airbnb rule that they have in Phoenix. So we are doing a lot of that. I think there could be more that we potentially do. Um, and we do understand that it is a concern, um, but we are very limited in what we can do related to that. Um, I did want to just really quickly touch back on, on mini dorms. Um, I, we really don't see this as leading to an increase in mini dorms over what is currently being developed out there. Um, so this proposal doesn't increase the site intensity from what is already allowed. Um, lot coverage and setbacks all remain the same. The group dwelling ordinance uh, standards all remain the same. The main difference is really how the buildings on the site are used. Um, so instead of an accessory access, of the accessory building being a guest space with no kitchen or garage um, or workshop, uh, we would now allow for the building to be a full dwelling unit. Instead of what we're seeing with a lot of the mini dorms and things of that sort that are gone, they basically just build out to the whole lot coverage. So it's either two structures or one structure, they're still using as much as they can for that. Um, I did go and do, and do some, some kind of review of, of different mini dorms and the size. So I know there have been comments that have, that have talked about, you know, these just becoming mini dorms, the size that I did, have, I just did a quick review of three of them. One of them was actually built after the, the group dwelling ordinance. They were 2,600 square feet, 2,650, and then 2,300 square feet um, for those. Significantly larger than the 1,000 square foot that would be allowed on the 7,000 square foot lot. Um, as definitely larger than the 750 allowed on the less than 7,000 square foot lot. Um, related to sustainability, um, so uh, what we are what what we are proposing for this is that all new ADUs uh, developed with a cool roof to address the urban heat island effect. Um, we talked about this a bit before. ADUs just are naturally kind of sustainable in a lot of ways because they support infill, um, and the benefits of infill, uh, you know use they, they use existing infrastructure they have increased density to support effective transit bike and ped systems um, as an alternative to sprawl um, increased density um, and more gentle density methods like this or even larger high density ones um, also are more economically sustainable um, as they are a much more efficient use of infrastructure so it helps with economic su uh, sustainability um, we have also heard, you know, throughout the process, concerns about water use and urban heat island effect. We talked about this a bit before. Um, we reached out to the University of Arizona um, and uh, led Keith, or yes, former Commissioner Keith, as you know him, um, it, to, to talk to him a bit about this. And this is what his primary research is, is in urban heat island effect and, and the effect of, of extreme heat. And basically what he had said is that gradually increasing density will not itself increase the urban heat island effect for a specific area. Um, he did say that the addition of a light colored roof or a cool roof um, could um, actually reduce the urban heat island effect, especially if there isn't much vegetation on the lot. So what we did, we went and looked at each, shared the study of Savano that showed that the reflective white roofs were used to kind of effectively mitigate the uh, urban heat island effect. So what we've done 
is basically, and, and this is one of those things where it's not consistent with, with our residential code. And we're hoping that, you know, potentially we can, you know, use this in the future for, for um, green building or something of that sort. Um, but we are requiring that cool roof um, for this um, proposal. Um, we heard a lot more related to other things. Oh, sorry, before I do that, related to water, I did want to mention that, you know, water is another thing. I know there's been a lot of concern about that. Um, but one of the best tools that we have for reducing per capita water consumption is increasing density. So this helps with that. Um, you'll see large, you know, more dense developments have a much large, much less of a per capita consumption than those that are on the periphery, those that have large lots that have lots of landscaping and things of that sort. Um, so uh, we know that there's a concern about adding a lot of sustainability regulations, and we want to make sure that we're addressing climate change, we're addressing all of these things, um, but we're also trying to balance affordability and we don't wanna add a whole bunch of regulations just to ADUs without addressing everything else. So I think what, what we believe is that really needs to be a greater conversation about new green building standards. And this totally aligns with the mayor's climate emergency declaration, climate action plan, the climate action plan they're working on, which will provide for guidance on that. Um, and we're really hoping to move forward and, and, and start to address a lot of those issues, but do it in a more holistic sense. We're looking at our code instead of just attaching it to these accessory dwelling units um, as part of that. Um, also must meet current energy code. So the summary of the proposal, um, 1,000 square foot maximum ADU size, uh, one ADU allowed per residential lot, um, one parking space required per ADU with reductions for transit access, um, no owner occupy, occupancy requirements, um, existing height lock coverage and standards apply, and then the cool roof is required. Um, so we, we, we reached back out to Opticos last time because I think we were having a hard time kind of visualizing what this may look like and what the impact could be. Um, we had them draw a couple perspective drawings, um, just of kind of how it would look um, if someone were to build a one story and then a two story ADU in their backyard. We just wanted to share those with you just so you get kind of an understanding of this. Um, so this would be kind of a one story ADU um, developed in someone's backyard um, related to that and kind of how it would look um, for that. Um, and then they also went through and helped us to develop a, a two story ADU, um, which is something kind of similar like this. Um, this is kind of what we're looking at. This is, we wanted to provide this to you. So you at least get an understanding of the scale and kind of what, what the proposal may be. Um, so with that, I, I did want to talk a little bit about, you know, we do have these ADU supportive programs. We know that this is just one part of the whole puzzle for affordability and affordable and affordable housing. Um, so uh, we are looking at um, different programs, uh, looking at, you know, a partnership with Quadro and Pima County Community Land Trust um, to conduct research and out, out, uh, outreach for technical assistance for low-income households. Um, develop model plans. So this is something that we've looked at a couple cities. Los Angeles has a list of 36 pre-approved ADU plans. Um, they range from you know, 316 square feet to 1200 square feet, which is their maximum. And you can just kind of pull those off the shelf. You pay for those there, which is interesting. Um, you'll have to pay the architects, but, um, but they're already approved. So it helps to reduce costs. Um, Stockton, California has free pre-approved plans. So they have a studio, a one bedroom and a two bedroom where you can just go in and grab those plans. So we're looking at other communities and how you can do that to help bring down those costs. So you don't have to pay for those architecture and engineering fees and everything that goes along with it. Um, explore local funding sources and options to provide financial assistance. So again, working with financial organizations to try to help with that type of thing. Um, one other thing that we're looking at, um, so we, we have existing programs as well. Um, and figuring out how that would apply to this. Um, it, the Housing Community Development Department currently has a home rehab program for low-income house homeowners. Um, this could also potentially be applied for our amnesty program, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, they're currently evaluating whether or not the program can make improvements for previously unpermitted ADUs or existing guest houses. So figuring out ways to use, to repurpose existing programs as well as are things that we're, we're looking at. Um, Talk a little bit about really just, you know, I know I know there's been concern um, how this addresses, you know, affordable housing. Um, really, it's looking at, you know, adding the supply of housing for our community. Overall housing supply, that's part of part of our issue right now. So we just don't have, we're not building fast enough to keep up with the demand. Um, market rate ADUs tend to rent for less um, 
than the neighborhood where the ADU uh, is located, um, promoting mixed income neighborhoods. And I know Commissioner Fink talked a little bit about this before. In the next slide, we actually went back to that study that that's from. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of example of kind of how that works. Um, smaller units can be lower cost to rent, um, which helps to reduce that cost. Um, units can be developed and rented for lower costs with subsidies and incentives. Not a lot of that is, is, is necessarily available, but it is possible. Um, we aren't promoting this as a, as a Section 8 only kind of program or things of that sort. It, it, it definitely works differently than that. Um, units can provide additional income for homeowners. So allowing for home ownership to become more sustainable, promoting neighborhood stability. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this is just that many units are not rented on the market, um, instead serving as housing for family members or friends and, and, and things of that sort. So, um, you know, they, they wouldn't have to actually go and rent, they, they, are, they, they would be living with family members. Um, we do want to mention as well that, you know, this is just a part of a lot of other, of, uh, other policies that we're doing or we're working on doing in order to um, provide affordable housing. Um, an example of this is what was just recently passed uh, along, along Broadway um, with the, with the uh, Sunshine Mile Overlay District. So looking at ways to, through market solutions, um, provide affordable housing through corridor projects as well. I know a lot of the comments are, you know, why, why are you um, looking at this when you should be looking at, you know, the parking lot for Elcon or all of these parcels that are along these corridors, we're looking at both. We're looking at as many, at, at, as many ways that we can address affordable housing. So those are market-based st strategies. We have a permit fee waiver for affordable housing in our department as well. Um, but then there's subsidies-based strategies as well, taking federal dollars and trying to figure out ways to provide, provide affordable housing. Um, going back just kind of with a question from Commissioner Fink at the study session about relative affordability, um, we looked at, there was a study by uh, Jake Wegman and, and uh, Chapel um, back from 2014, um, looking at hidden density in single family neighborhoods. Um, the study looked at the provision of locally affordable housing by a secondary unit and found that secondary units, which are ADUs, are likelier to provide rental housing that is affordable within the neighborhood context than rental housing in general. So um, if you were to build a, an apartment complex, this would rent for less uh, these would rent for less than that account complex in the same local local area. So it's local affordability is what it's talking about. Um, unlike absentee owned rental housing, secondary units have the potential to also provide an income stream, allowing for homeowners to stay in place. Um, and, and really they, their, their conclusions on this, and these are, these are what they concluded. Um, secondary units facilitate entry to non-affluent residents into otherwise unattainable neighborhoods. Um, secondary units also can further um, contribute to income diversity by helping existing homeowners age in place in this transformative life events, job loss, retirement, health setbacks. This is what they presented essentially, um, is that they have this ratio to rent tracked income by location. On here, they have the lowest third, medium third, highest third. So, um, and it shows the secondary units, which is the blue, compared to the other rental units that are there, which are generally the multifamily units. And they found across the board, they rented for less than the other ones, allowing for it to come down. Now, I know that in certain neighborhoods, it's still expensive, but it's definitely allowing for people who can't afford the full price to move into those neighborhoods and, and allow for at least some sense of income diversity within that area. Um, one other research paper that has come out in the last month or so since we presented to you, um, this was shared to us by Dr. Nelson at the University of Arizona. Um, and it really was talking about anti-displacement strategies. And um, this was listed as one of the few strategies to promote affordable housing development that does not depend on a strong market. So we, I know our, our market's getting stronger, um, but we're not as San Diego, we're not a San Francisco, LA, Portland, um, but they, they said it, was a, uh, it, it is one of the few that doesn't necessarily depend on a strong market. Um, they listed ADUs as relatively low cost way to pr pr uh, produce new housing. Um, and then it, they said it may, it, it may represent an effective strategy to add low cost housing, but, it, but their effectiveness in preventing displacement may rely on additional regulations. And this is why we're looking at additional programs um, related to that. So um, other ADU supported programs, that's kind of what we're looking at with affordable housing. There's a lot of things that we have to do to help support this. 
Um, but but there is, you know, it is something that we need to do in the city due to the recent issues related to unaffordability. Um, amnesty program, uh, amnesty program for unpermitted and guest houses. So again, we are looking at um, figuring out a way to uh, to basically help to create incentives to bring unpermitted ADUs into conformance with code and convert existing guest quarters. Um, basically what, what we did, we went and looked at programs in other areas. So there are a lot of these. Um, we looked at San Jose, San Mateo County, um, Barnstable, Mass, Massachusetts, uh, Santa Cruz County and Tacoma, Washington. Um, and a lot of times, you know, what they do is they, they, they have the timeline. You can come in one to three years or something of that sort. Um, a lot of them will waive fees. So penalty fees, building permit fees, impact fees um, help with this to kind of reduce that cost as people come in. Right now we're charging double fees. So even if we just bring it down to the normal burning fees, that helps. Um, code flexibility, uh, you, need to re you, know, you need to meet um, health, life and safety, but ways there may be ways to um, allow for some zoning code uh, flexibility or building code flexibility, as long as it still meets um, that meets those health, life, and safety measures. Um, one interesting thing was that they uh, they allowed for certain flexibility if it were to be used for um, affordable housing. Uh, so that that's kind of an interesting way of doing it. Um, there was a rehabilitation loan program as well, so um, so that's possible as well. So an example of that, yeah. So we could you know talk about you know work with HCD and try to figure out ways to potentially do that for low income household homeowners. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our online survey, um, just give you an update on where we're at with that. Um, we have received uh, another hundred plus uh, 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 results since we last talked to you. So um, it is starting to fill out a bit. Um, we're still struggling with the area kind of south Tucson um, as far as uh, the distribution of where we're hearing from, but the rest of the city seems to be pretty um, well covered. There are definitely clusters in certain areas in Midtown. You see, you know, um, as you'll see in the comments as well, you know, um, certain areas are definitely um, involved um, related to this. Um, so uh, initial survey results, as you see, the ADU build, maximum building size, I think, has been an issue. Um, it's the one that doesn't have the proposal about right as the highest one. So um, this has changed since last time. There have been a lot of people that have, that have um, kind of uh, joined in, um, but but that is the one that we're really seeing as likely being the one that we need to make adjustments to, and that's why we, we propose to change it to you. Um, the other ones um, related to this, you're still seeing the majority of them in that middle three categories for development standards, um, parking as well. Um, sustainability, it seems like that one has the most amount of consensus on a proposal about rights. Um, owner occupancy, there's 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 a little bit of concern about owner occupancy and we definitely have seen issues related to, you know, um, uh, to Airbnbs and things of that sort. Um, and then one ADU per lot. Um, so we're really still for most of them staying in those middle categories, um, except for the, um, the ADU size. Um, again, uh, this is kind of where we're at. You're seeing the majority of people in the top two categories. Um, and even the top three, um, but there's 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 definitely been an increase with I think there is a there's a bit of concern in the, in the community um, related to this and say that you know 25% believe you know strongly disagree that this will be a benefit to the community. Um, so primary concerns um, just kind of related to this and there were more than this obviously but these were really the big ones. Um, ADU size too big, uh, too big overall for lots of smaller homes. Um, you know, we did adjust our proposal related to this, um, and we, we do believe that it is in line with the regulations that we see in many other cities, as we provided the information to you earlier. Um, occupancy, uh, there's concern about speculative and investor-driven rentals, um, absentee landlords and behavioral issues. Um, those come along with also the, uh, the short-term rentals. Um, you know, we, 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 do, we don't support the owner occupancy for a number of reasons, as we talked about earlier. Um, just because of the effectiveness of the program, especially providing affordable housing, and that it it it, it makes things much more difficult for for people. Um, we did have a suggestion um, that was provided to our stakeholder group from Lee Marsh, who I believe will be speaking to Lee has requested to speak at least um, to potentially and and you know we'd like to get feedback on this, um, but potentially uh, having a one year. 
um, owner occupancy requirement then goes away after a year um, to to kind of at least help with that or potentially maybe phasing it out over time or whatever. But that was that was his um, proposal for that. Um, one thing that you know it, it's it's really hard because speculative investor driven rentals are something that really is beyond. It, it's not solely an ADU issue. It's something that's um, that's that's difficult to address through zoning, um, and it's it's really a greater market related issue that would probably require action at a state or federal level. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to address. Um, and then historic districts, and we talked about this earlier, um, we have consulted with our historic preservation office. We shared our presentation with, with the SHPO um, and we, we, we really do not believe that this will have much, it will, will have much if any impact on the National Register historic districts. Um, the only time that we can see it happening is if it's someone who had a house who has continually degraded that house through walls, through changing of the facade, changing of the roof line, changing of windows, and then decided to add an ADU um, related to that. Um, we did have, we have had a bit of support as well. Um, so some of the primary reasons for, um, for, for support that we've seen, you know, provides more affordable housing options uh, in the city. Um, provides additional options for senior housing and supports multi-generational housing um, for those who would like to age in place. Um, and then so supports uh, sustainability measures in the city of Tucson. Um, so, um, you know, this idea that density makes multimodal transportation options more viable. We're trying to build density, not necessarily a lot of density in existing neighborhoods. It's that idea of gentle density and spread throughout. Um, you saw there's only 202 or 220 um, ADUs that were built in 2019 in San Diego, but it helps. Every bit helps. You have multi-strategies to try to do this thing. Um, helps to provide housing options in already developed areas instead of pushing residents to the periphery um, for that. So um, with that, uh, I, I know it's a long presentation. I really appreciate uh, your attention to this. Um, uh, we do recommend a, uh, a approval to the motion um, to recommend approval to the accessory dwelling units, UDC text amendment to mayor and council. Um, one of the comments, and you've probably seen it a lot in the comments we've been reading um, related to this was that there have been quite a few requests, even at the last study session, um, to potentially continue this public hearing to when more people are in town um, so they can you know, also join and, uh, and um, provide input. Um, so we did, did just want to draw your attention to that. Um, should you do that, um, it's better to it's better to not close the public hearing and then have to reopen it. It could create some issues just related to legal avenues and the Unified Development Code. Um, so if you were to choose to do that, um, continue it before you close the public hearing. So with that, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you and the staff for uh, your thorough research, presentation, and out, outreach. Um, so at this time, I'd like to open it up for questions from the commissioners. Commissioner Martin, I believe uh, Commissioner Fink has his hand up. Yeah, I, I actually saw it this time. So <laughs> Okay. I know you've been Fink. having trouble with that. I know. Commissioner Fink? Okay. Uh one, uh, I'm impressed, Daniel, that you could give an hour long presentation. I don't know if I could have ever done that when I was working for the county. So well done. Um, for this portion, I just have a, a couple of clarifying questions. Um, one, I thought I knew what it meant, but then during your presentation, I got a little confused. So the idea of owner occupancy, is it that people are asking that the ADU be an owner-occupied dwelling, or that the main that at least one of the structures, either the ADU or the main structure, be owner-occupied. So, Commissioner, question? yeah. So, Commissioner Fink, that's um, we've seen both um, as far as uh, ordinances. Uh, generally, the one that's more often used is that one or the other um, should be owner-occupied. Okay. Um, and then I'm just kind of curious, um, we, I looked a little bit today, but just um, the size of, let's say one bedroom apartments in the city or even two bedroom apartments, do you have any information on that? What kind of is a average size? 
they 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 really range. Um, the ones that we've seen, you know, I, I so I, I lived in a one bedroom when I first moved to Tucson, and it was around 600 square feet. Um, I've, I, we've seen them range up to about a thousand square feet or so for two bedrooms. Uh, they usually go between 600 and, and around a thousand or so. Okay. Just for other people's information, I looked at the, uh, floor plans for the Benedictine monastery and their one bedrooms are 630 square feet and their two bedrooms are about 790 square feet. So just for perspective. And then my last, this is more a comment on affordable housing. Um, the term gets used all the time and means a million different things. And I think we need to be really careful when we use the term affordable housing. To me, affordable housing is providing housing for low and very low income families. And even that study that you presented talked about, well, it's more affordable in the context of the neighborhood, which is a very different thing. So I think going forward, um, in our discussions, we need to be really clear what we're talking about when we use the term affordable housing, because I can see conversations where the people are just talking past each other because they're using two or three completely different definitions. So with that, thank you. And see, oh, Commissioner Cassidy. Thank you, Chair Martin. I have a couple of questions. One is on the owner occupancy suggestion, either um, the one year idea or in perpetuity. How would that be enforced? So Commissioner Cassidy, it's, um, it's difficult, uh, especially in a city the size of Tucson. We've seen it work, but with a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of staff time and resources to do so in places like Flagstaff. We actually um discussed it with their building official and they had basically a um a deed restriction that was added to uh the property um for that and then they basically were the ones to enforce and make sure that that would happen sometimes there are waivers or they have to register every year um the the way we would look at it would potentially be just you know when you come in at least for the one year um, when you'd come in for that, for your permits or whatever, you would have a signed affidavit saying that you would be living on, on the premise at that house. Okay. And my second question has to do with a couple of the requirements that are being included in the ordinance. The first is about the inclusive home design. Um, actually, they're both related to the cost. I was wondering if you'd looked at what the cost is on average to add the inclusive home design elements as well as the cool roof? Like what's the delta versus including those and not including those? Um, so the inclusive home design is already required for our whole code. So okay. um, so that you're already required for that. You can get a waiver for that um, potentially um, for if you if you were to um, I think if there's a certain cost threshold. If it's too much money or too difficult, you can get a waiver for it. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but that is a possibility um, if the costs were too high. Um, related to the cool roofs, um, we, we've kind of had our discussion with, uh, with our building official and we're hoping that it would be, um, we'd have both low cost options, which are things like light color roofs or white roofs. So that would be just basically a coating of paint so it could be very low compared to, and I do, I, we just recently put cool shingles on our roof. Um, those are more expensive. There's more technological kind of ways of doing that, which in historic districts, you may be required to do so in order to meet whatever those historic standards are. Um, but for the most part, our, our thought is that it wouldn't be very cost prohibitive for the cool roofs because we're kind of keeping it wide as far as what they can do. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Any other commissioners that have questions for staff? Uh, seeing none, um, Dan, I know we talked about this before, but uh, if the principal dwelling, well, the ADU can't be in front of the principal dwelling. And if the uh, ADU is larger than the existing home, doesn't does it become the principal? use on the site. Um, um, so I, Chair, 
Sorry, Hi. Chair Martin. Yeah, so um, the uh, the ADU is not allowed to be in front of the um, the principal structure. Um, so ultimately, you wouldn't. You, it would still be be the ADU. It, you, there's a possibility that the ADU would be larger than the principal structure in certain circumstances because it is behind it and not in front of it. Um, this is this is you know that this is consistent with the AARP uh, model. Um, ordinance where they also have the ability to have a larger principal structure or a smaller principal structure than the ADU um, as I presented on earlier. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no more questions from commissioners, um, I would like to now open this up to any, um, sorry, open the meeting up at the public hearing to members of the public who would like to speak about this item. Um, we have 28 speakers signed up, so I want to limit it to three minutes per speaker. Um, all of you that sent in emails and letters, the commissioners have copies of all those and should have reviewed them by now. I think you need to just use the, um, point out your um, the main points of your um, emails and letters. Um, also, if, if somebody else has talked about your point, um, I think if you could say you agree with what previous speakers have said and not reiterate it, um, it'll make it go faster. Um, so the first speaker is Ryan Stevenson. Uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Martin and Chair. Uh, I would like to thank, um, I'm going to turn off my cooler so you guys can hear me a little better. Uh, I would like to thank Dan for uh, doing that marathon as well as running our, our stakeholder group. I'd like to thank uh, Corin Manning and I'd like to thank Opticos. Uh, they're you know one of the leading firms in the country advancing uh, missing middle housing. Uh, there's a few things about this that are really great and then some that can use um, so, some updating. Um, the, the, the fact that we already allow um, uh, additional units on properties uh, it just kind of points to some of the absurdity of what we're talking about. We're, we're just adding kitchens or we're allowing kitchens to be built into this stuff. And then we're discussing whether or not we're going to pave over, uh, continue to pave over private lots um, in light of uh, last year's climate, climate emergency declaration. Uh, America already has eight parking spaces to every single car in the country. So I would encourage the commission to um, amend the ordinance to not require any additional parking. Um, as you've seen, they did their survey of benchmarking uh, other cities and uh, it, this wouldn't be the most progressive by um, in, uh, requiring additional parking for, for any of these ADUs. Um, Year over year, the National Association of Realtors does studies for walkable places and they demonstrate growing demand for walkable places. And um, uh, like our, our supply is so much shorter. So there's, there's, a, um, there's a part of the market that we're not catching and ADUs are, are a part of how we could um, uh, solve that problem. So uh, they, they said that impact fees were designed a year ago with ADUs in mind. And so that tells you that the city already wants ADUs. So I again, I would just reiterate that um, in order for you to pass the, this ordinance. Uh, one of the things that's missing is there's nothing in the language as far as preservation of tree canopy. I think that's one of the things, that, that's one of the shortcomings of this ordinance. So um, if there's something that we could put in there uh, related to preservation of mature tree canopy, I think that would be uh, really helpful to um, maintaining uh, cool spaces inside our city. And uh, I think that would be the summary of what I'm asking for. I just don't want uh, the commission or mayor and council after directing the city uh, staff to study ADUs to kneecap the capacity of ADUs to address um, these goals. So please do um, make this recommendation, Mayor and Council, to adopt this ADU ordinance and please apply a couple things, um, which would be to not include the parking requirement and instead require something for a preservation of our mature tree canopy. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Corky Poster. Um, Commissioner, uh, Chair Martin, I believe, I don't believe Corky was able to make it. Oh, I'm sorry, I said may not make it. Uh, next speaker is Vicki France. Okay, I am ready. Uh, I forgot, I didn't, I wasn't in the room when I had my time limit. What's my time limit? Three minutes. Okay. Um, our central city neighborhoods should have an important say in the issues of accessory dwelling units. Many of our neighborhoods were built in the 1930s to the 1960s. Also, many of our city residents are in HOAs and can get out of this restriction. Um, our streets carry the runoff. Our houses are old, as is the infrastructure, both on the lots and private, I mean, public and private in, in infrastructure. We had no density calculations for all of these uh, public and private systems when a lot of our subdivisions were built. So my main concern is the flooding that already exists in our neighborhoods. So if you're gonna double the lot, double the number of units on the lot. How is the uh, Pima County Flood District and our streets going to handle the increase uh, of runoff? Um, it's increasing the imper impermeable surface. And how many more houses are you going to flood downstream? Um, infill was also talked about. Um, so back to my question about the age. Um, so if you have a online sewer system that is 70 years old, are you going to require the sewer system to be upgraded to code if you're going to add a, a thousand square foot dwelling unit? Um, same with the uh, public systems. Can the public water and sewer systems handle the added burden? Because these guys are 70 years old. Uh, another point I'd like to make is we're not Savano. Um, we have a lot of problems the city's trying to solve. Uh, green infrastructure, water harvesting, gray water use, one million trees, sustainability, flood control, urban farming, food security. Why are we pampering all these problems trying to solve affordability? Uh, you're trying to solve affordability on the backs of the central neighborhood. Uh, last thing I, one of the last things I thought was great is um, the uh, transportation issue. I think you ought to limit all ADUs to within 300 feet of a SunTran line. This will support gentle multimodal systems. Um, who wants to walk a quarter of a mile in the middle of the summer? You're gonna get in your car. Finally, um, I think you should consider the area plans uh, in your decisions. I am working with the Grant Alvernon area plan now, and it is uh, very heavily um, prioritizing, um, maintaining single family residential character. So I think that the existing proposal kind of looks at everything with rose-colored glasses. I can't wrap it up, please? Okay. So I, can I that's get your name it. and address? Thank you. I get your name and address, please? Um, Vicky, Vicky France, 3403 East Seneca, right down the street from the Seneca River. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Bonji Numi, sorry. Okay, the next speaker is Lee Marsh. Is Lee here? Yes, hello. How's it going? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lee Marsh. I live at 1127 East 8th Street. I'm a homeowner in the Rincon Heights neighborhood. 
Uh, as Daniel mentioned, I was uh, involved in the working group, but probably only in the most peripheral sense possible. Now I have three minutes, so I'm gonna try to go really fast here. Um, so I just wanna say that I'm generally supportive of the program. Um, I think this is something that could awful, offer a lot of potential good for the city. And I think that the planning staff has worked really diligently uh, to try to find some sort of balance between meeting the needs of a growing city and sort of the concerns that come with that. And just, just in full disclosure, you know, I'm a homeowner. This is a program that I would like to, in the not so distant future, take advantage of myself. So, you know, that's kind of the direction that I'm coming at this from. Um, but all that said, I do have some outstanding concerns. I got about three concerns I just wanted to address real quick. Uh, the first was, was size. And actually, the, the proposal was changed a little bit tonight. I didn't even have a chance to see those changes before this evening. Um, so I think I need some time to sort of digest that. But I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, you know, initially, I was thinking 1,000 square feet is a little bit of a large size. 750 to 800 square feet seems a little more on the money to me. I know Feldman's uh, neighborhood also submitted a letter uh, with some suggestions, and I thought they had some pretty good ideas. But just in general, I would just remind people that ADU stands for uh, accessory dwelling unit and not additional dwelling unit. Um, the second point I wanted to address was affordability, and I think some thought is being put towards this in terms of partners and, and programs that could sort of complement this. And I guess I would just like to see those a little more fleshed out. Um, I, again, I think there's a lot of potential with ADUs in terms of affordability, um, but that's a little bit glossed over. And I, you know, we've heard a lot about the technical details. I would like to hear a little bit more about some of the programs to support ADUs for affordability. And then finally, uh, owner occupancy. Daniel actually quoted uh, a suggestion that I had sent over the email to the working group. And you know, basically it was that I, I never really imagined that owner occupancy would be something that would be in perpetuity. Uh, but rather something that would have some sort of time limit. This is how FHA loans are structured. I think there's also precedence with um, work permits that are available to uh, owner occupied, you know, trades work that's completed. Um, so, so, you know, there is, there's other examples of, of how this has been structured in terms of enforcement and legal structure. Um, and to Commissioner Cassidy's question, about enforcing such a standard. I, absolutely, I think all of these sorts of things are extremely difficult to enforce, um, but I just think it's important that there's some kind of rules in place so that if someone does get their hand stuck in the cookie jar, there's, there's a rule to slap them with. Um, and really the reason I think this owner occupancy is important is because the ADU program is being sold on the ideas of aging in place, affordability and building property value for generational wealth. And I think all those things are really kind of pointing towards our occupancy. And so I think just any sort of standard that kind of oh, points in that direction would be good. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, obviously planning staff is, is trying to get this right on the first try. Um, but if you're choosing between being more or less restrictive, maybe being a little bit more restrictive at first would be the direction to go because with Prop 207, um, once changes in land use are in place, it's, it's very hard to undo them. And of course, if the program wasn't meeting its intended goals of growing housing, that's something that could be revisited in the future. Thank you. That's your time. Yep, uh, thank next you. Next speaker is Lois Pollock. I'm here. Great. I'm Lois Pollock. I'm uh, Lois Pollock, president of the Garden District Neighborhood Association. I live at the 4100 block of East Leicester Street. I believe uh, I'm, I'm not often I speak for myself and other times I'm speaking for the neighborhood. Proposed changes uh, to the ADU ordinance will have a huge impact on all residents in Tucson. It will depend on the neighborhood's age and existing structures, overall socioeconomic status, the current density, the percentage of rentals, percentage of rental owned by professional investment companies, the amount of current crime and many other factors. Proposed change of adding a thousand square feet of li living space as a second home on a single property will have irreversible impacts and in effect in R1 and R2 zoning. Garden District has been the recipient of many bad zoning decisions and lot splits in the past, which have highly contributed to the stress in the area. We do not want more bad decisions. ADU will not be affordable since rents are market driven. A thousand square feet are too big for most elderly people aging in place to manage. ADU is larger than the existing home should not be allowed. 
a lot of our homes are 900 square feet or less, and it will dwarf the existing home. AD changes will not inhibit sprawl. All surrounding cities, Marana, Oro Valley, Vail, they will continue to sprawl out. I don't think that's a valid argument. Issues created will include a loss of available green space, trees, and other vegetation. With a, with a current 74% rental rate per the 2020 census, we have a lower tree canopy than neighborhoods with higher owner-occupied homes. Rarely is there a rental that has trees or other vegetation because investors know it costs money to water, so they don't. We cannot afford to lose more trees and vegetation. A white roof is not vegetation and will not solve our issue of lack of trees and shade and green space. There will be increases in people, crime, vehicle traffic, resident noise, building without permits and code enforcement issues with a decrease in privacy. The city has a lack of resources to support an increase in density and police these issues. Our homes are older with carports and garages that are built on the property lines, which have been or are being converted to ADUs without going through the permit process. Setbacks will not be adhered to because currently there are no setbacks for those types of structures. Residents who own a home and reside in a Tucson neighborhood are dwindling. In Garden District, single family homes are being bought at a very high rate. I'm estimating approximately up to 75% by professional investors just in the last eight months. Any structure is already being turned into a rentable ADU almost 100% of the time with 100% of the time being no permit, uh, requiring intervention by code enforcement with no help from the city for proactive enforcement. This, this leaves the burden on the neighborhood and the residents to turn in their neighbors. I am an advocate for all residents to have a voice in a democratic process. To date, there is a statistically invalid number of responses or letters from Tucson residents to know what residents are in favor or not in favor of, yet planning commission presentations state that an overwhelming number of people are in favor of the proposed changes. These increased issues of the ADU changes will more significantly impact lower income, high rental, high density neighborhoods more than those in more affluent areas as many of the 147 city neighborhoods have minimal representation. So they won't even know about the issues going on. It's just going to be occurring. Data being presented to planning commission and stakeholder meetings has typically been two years old from 2019, 2020, which is not reflective of current market conditions. Changes need to be for Tucson, not based on other cities ordinance and trends that are not Tucson. These are there are so many important issues to consider to craft the ordinance changes. I am advocating for a postponement in the commission's recommendation to the mayor and council until all issues from all neighborhoods and, and types of residents are considered. At this point in time, not all issues appear Excuse to have me. been- Could I get you to wrap it up, please? In time, not all issues appear to have been seriously considered with many being put aside as unimportant or unresolvable. I'm also advocating for when any changes are made that there'll be a pilot program in minimal number of neighborhoods, maybe one or two, in order to test the changes. Turning on the waterworks to the entire city will be devastating and have permanent damage to the city and its architectural history. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pollock. Next speaker is Diana Lett. Hi, my name's Diana Lett. I live at 1309 North First Avenue. I am the Vice President of Feldman's Neighborhood Association. I was also a member of the Stakeholders Committee, and tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Feldman's Neighborhood Association. Uh, most of Feldman's is a National Register Historic District, and about two-thirds of the neighborhood has a City of Tucson Neighborhood Preservation Zoning. Um, we do have a lot of commercial zoning and that is typical of historic neighborhoods close to the uh, downtown area. Um, the Neighborhood Association is supportive of the ADU concept. We have some significant concerns about this ordinance as written. Um, the primary one is the size of the units. A um, thousand square feet on a 7,000 square foot lot does not work for us and that the current proposal where the 7,000 square foot size is a cutoff. Um, most of our lots are 7,500 square feet, plus or minus a little bit. Um, most of our houses are well under 1,000 square feet. The original uh, square footage was about 700 square feet. A lot of them are now about 900 square feet with 
additions having built over the years. Our existing pre-1948 ADUs are vastly smaller than 1,000 square feet, typically smaller than 300 square feet. Um, so we're, we're talking about a proposal that would cause a huge irreversible damage in the character of our neighborhood. And we've worked very hard to get the protections that we do have. So we are concerned about this. Um, there are a number of ways this could be addressed in the ordinance. Um, the simplest way would be simply to make the cutoff size of the lots uh, that are, are allowed to have a thousand square foot unit to make that cut off at 8, 000, uh, 8,000 square feet. Um, other approaches are uh, different size limits, different um, percentages of the primary unit allowable in an ADU. We have included some of that thinking in a letter that you've received. Um, we really like to see this issue addressed and the section that needs to be looked at here is 6.6.3.B.4. Um, we also find two-story buildings very problematic. Um, what we have seen in our neighborhood and in other historic neighborhoods is when two-story buildings go up, and yes, we're talking mini dorms here because that's what we've experienced, but I think it would also apply to other two-story buildings. You are looking at um, a significant loss of property value and a significant attrition in long-term homeowners who simply leave when that kind of construction goes in. Um, the section that would need to be looked at to um, prevent two-story ADUs would be 6.6.3.D. As a previous uh, speaker mentioned, we would support um, protecting landscaping, either protecting the original trees, the uh, mature canopy trees, or um, additional tree planting. Um, this is not hugely onerous. We do have uh, trees for Tucson and other ways that people can get trees very inexpensively. And what we would like to see is um, some kind of a ratio such as one five gallon tree per 2,200 square feet of floor area in the ADU. Excuse um, me, can I get you to wrap it up please? Um, okay, um, I just wanna point out to you that um, we typically in this city do um, require a public benefit to be prepared, to be paired with incentivized development. And lastly, I wanna ask for a sunset clause. We've proposed two to three years as the sunset so that unintended consequences can be rectified. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hannah Glaston. Thank you. Um, I think that- uh, Can I get your I address, please? Sir? Oh, sorry, Hannah Glaston, 2619 East Maple Street in the Blenman Elm Historic District. Um, I just want to say I want to agree with the uh, speakers who uh, thought that the process should be postponed until we can discuss a lot of these really good issues that have uh, both in uh, letters that have been submitted and speakers tonight that need to be addressed. Uh, I think the process is uh, just too fast, uh, having been uh, directed by uh, the council in November and, and now in July, already giving them something I think is just too fast. Um, I want to say that in Blenman Elm, we've worked really hard actually to increase uh, home ownership. Uh, as of 2015, according to the Dragman Institute, we had 38% home ownership in our neighborhood. I don't know what it is in 2020. I hope that you have those figures to see what home ownership is uh, among your neighborhoods. Um, but we've participated in mayor sponsored programs uh, where we man tables to let people know about mortgage help. We've uh, We've uh, obviously applied for and received historic district status. We've tried to inform new people uh, about putting up walls and things uh, to the point where we, you know, because they would lose their property tax uh, incentive. And we've had people where we say, hey, just want to let you know, you know, your wall, that wall is going to take you off the historic roll. And they're like, we don't care. We're not going to live here. Um, so we've also uh, 
put together this Tucson's historic neighborhood map. We've distributed a lot just to really encourage uh, home ownership. We do have a lot of guest houses here, and I know there are a lot of guest houses in other uh, areas. And I think actually we should start with an amnesty program. Why don't we uh, start with the amnesty program and upgrade the guest houses first and uh, then start building new ADUs. We have a lot of empty homes also. I don't know if you have an empty home registry, if there's any anybody's done something like that, but we have numerous empty homes here. And I don't know if they'd be able to be purchased by the city or um, you know, used as low income housing. Um, I'm particularly concerned about keeping people in their houses. Uh, just this month in Austin, for example, city staff was asked to figure out how they could start making their ADUs more affordable because they found that, you know, that low and moderate income people were not able to access ADUs. And uh, one of the things that they found is that ADUs actually don't prevent displacement of existing residents uh, as they had hoped. Uh, a lot of low and moderate income homeowners had just too many barriers to building. And uh, what they identified they would rather have was low or no cost home repairs uh, and saving money on utilities. They found that more helpful than being able to build an ADU rental uh, on their property. They're also seeing a lot of flipped ADUs with the smaller house in the front. I know that ours says, oh, we're not going to do that, but it's interesting that people are saying, well, I'll build a larger one in the back and then move into the front, you know, later on. Um, I Excuse think me, can I get that, you to wrap it up, please? Sure. I also think we should look at expanding historic neighborhoods so that we have a little bit more protection. Uh, and um, I also think that we should have some kind of a sunset uh, clause as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Joe Sullivan. And the next speaker is Josefina Cardenas. Okay. Buenas noches. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Josefina Cardenas, resident in Barrio Cobra Lane, 902 West 21st Street. And uh, I would like to give my gratitude of such an action being taken in our barrios, in most barrios, casitas, now we're saying ADUs have been existing. That's how we've been able to sustain and keeping our families together and uh, helping each other. And now that this is um, going to continue, there's more sustainability within barrios, as well as we're hoping it'll be affordable. I want to also um, give my gratitude because I've been attending the public meetings in this process and most of, well, practically everything has been mentioned. Thank you, Senor Daniel. That hour that you gave us is very intense of all the, the public information that we have given. So I applaud what we're doing and uh, that we support each other as community. It's going to keep us together. That's how the body of people have been holding together. But muchas gracias and I look forward to it being affordable because that's what our father people will, will appreciate it. And we won't no longer be illegal or undocumented, no? Because I'm also hoping that this process will also make it easier that we are not under the table or behind closed doors, that that's our way of, of life, that's our value. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Next speaker is Gabriela Aguilera. Next speaker on the list is Rachel Beatty. Okay. <laughs> Hi. That's awkward. Um, can y'all hear me? So I actually, I'm gonna um, let my uh, 
my uh, colleague speak for um, PCCLT and Quadro, but I wanted to share something that we got from somebody named Gary Bachman. Um, Gary lives, he says, I live in the Country Glen neighborhood, um, so the Country Club Glen area, and the Casa Solargia subdivision within that area. There are about um, 118 lots, mostly uh, 10,000 square feet. Um, I did a visual survey and counted 30 secondary units. These may be ADUs fully created under zoning, guest homes, large studios, and sheds, which may have been used or could be converted into ADUs. I may have missed a few and may have counted garages or sheds that are not habitable. Anyway, the neighborhood has not been destroyed. We are 50% low income and 50% rental. And by most accounts, it is a desirable place to live. There are several small multifamily units west of the hood. Additional small units will not impact the neighborhood, but, the, but some users, inhabitants, might as, might as happens in any part of the city. There are some Airbnb units and numerous students that live there. Seems to, be, seems to me to be a nice mix of older folks like me, younger families, and so on. Um, so he just wanted to um, you know, speak in support of the ADU policy um, and, and kind of speak about um, their impact in his neighborhood that he has now. So thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Soraya Jimenez. Hey. Hello. Hi, everybody. We're here at Picklet right now. We had a little viewing party. We had food, and um, it's been a good time. Thank you, everyone, who supported. Our kids left, but uh, yeah, it's been good. So um, my name is <laughs> Sherea Jimenez. I am a the principal designer of Cuadro. For the past several months, I've been a part of the ADU stakeholder groups. I also sit on both the city and county's housing commissions, and I'm a member of the city's industrial development authority. I'm also president of Barrio Blue Moon Neighborhood Association, and I'm a Southside resident. I've been working in the affordable housing industry for over a decade, and in that time, I've witnessed public funding dry up for affordable housing, support removed from planning and development services, and the local zoning code become increasingly more restrictive. This is the opposite direction we need to be headed in as a community. And the combination of this and several other factors have led to our current housing affordability crisis as construction is not only accessible to a largely wealthy minority. This ADU code amendment is one small step towards the alle alleviation of some of these issues. And through, the, through the, the Vitalist Health Foundation, my firm has been awarded a systems change grant to work on the development of, of an affordable ADU program in partnership with the Pima Community Land Trust. The city of Tucson's planning development services and how housing and community development. We have also support from wards one and three and multiple neighborhood associations. Although we are at the beginning of this process, we hope to create a program that will be geared towards low to moderate. And I think low to moderate is the range. You know, it's, it's a, the, the construction has just become so affordable just for the middle class, you know, even. Um, and as a South, um, and we see ADUs as one piece of this larger affordable housing strategy for our community. As a Southside resident, I see how time, in times of economic crisis, like the COVID era we are now in, households often collapse with three to four generations moving into one home. I have also seen creative solutions with fo folks creating duplexes or additions to accommodate their expanding families. With the ever increasing fees and technical requirements at the development services level, these families have been mostly entirely priced out of the construction process. And there's little incentive for these homeowners to permit their projects because of the added delay permitting creates as well as the added cost. Yeah. If we want to reach the low to moderate income homeowners and provide a safer, more accessible path for construction, over the counter review needs to be reinstated and permit or impact fees need to be waived or reduced. By offering a path for low to moderate income homeowners to develop their own properties, we can help keep generational wealth within these neighborhoods and hopefully provide opportunities for folks to generate income through rental properties or share housing costs by allowing for multiple gener multiple dwellings for multiple generations. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing how uh, our grant work develops. Thank you, everybody. Woo! Thank you. Next speaker is Wesley Fawcett Craig. Hi there. Um, I'm also a collaborator with um, PCCLT and Quadro on this initiative to create a program to promote ADU accessibility for um, low to moderate income spectrum. We've seen that there's a national precedent. Every community that's rolled out these ADU ordinances um, has been supported typically by one or a network of programs um, 
or organizations dedicated to helping them become affordable. Um, I guess I just wanted to build off of what has already been said by my colleagues and just really put the spotlight on the reason we're even discussing ADUs today, which is the, the massive like housing uh, crisis and insecurity that we have in our community and how you know to address a complex problem like housing, we will need a variety of tools and um, ADUs are obviously not gonna be a tool that will work for everyone, but it will work for someone, for, for many, um, and just help alleviate this like larger social challenge that we're all facing right now. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Address please. 2646 East 20th Street. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Maggie Amando Teas. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, all your hard work, work the stakeholders, uh, the, you know, the city. Uh, I really do appreciate it. I um, am the executive director of the Pima County Community Land Trust. And if you don't know who we are, or what we do, uh, we are all about um, creating opportunities of affordable housing. And we're trying to look for um, a lot of different ways that we can we can do that to provide safe, decent housing for low and moderate income households. And it's becoming, I mean, this is my day job. I, I know how difficult it is for people to afford uh, the crazy purchase price that are out there and the crazy rent, rent amounts and uh, the lack of inventory. So uh, Pete Mechanic Community Land Trust totally supports another initiative like the ADUs that could, and I believe will, provide um, affordable housing opportunities for low and moderate income households. And, um, you know, we all know this, we all know there's no inventory. So I think we, we need to uh, think out of the box and uh, give this a chance. So I applaud all of you and uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker is Corinne Cooper. Hello, I'm Corinne Cooper and I live at uh, 1323 East Renfrew Place in the um, Campus Farm neighborhoods. I'm a member of the Neighborhood Association, but I'm representing only myself today. I'm also a, uh, a mom, no pop landlord in the neighborhood. And I wanted to speak a little bit about the price of rent. In our neighborhood, which is very much of a mixed income neighborhood, rents have gone up between 30 and 50% in the last 18 months to two years. And it has become so such a crisis that seniors who've been living in rental homes in our neighborhood and in Central City uh, in Tucson have uh, found that their, uh, their leases they've lived in places for 15 years and they're being told that their leases will not be renewed because the rental price has gone up so dramatically that uh, people are not willing to keep even long-term good tenants. Um, I think that we need to understand for those people who are worried about, you know, stress on the infrastructure and parking, let's remember that, that one of the things that makes our neighborhoods livable is that we have, um, neighbors and friends who we've known for a long time. And we want to make sure that those people can remain in their homes. And we have a growing, it's about to become a crisis in, in three or four days, we're going to have a dramatic crisis as the, um, the eviction uh, moratorium expires. We're going to see even a more dramatic increase in the unhoused here in Tucson. And anything that can increase affordability and increase the stock of affordable housing is something that we should all be supporting. I do uh, have some concern and I share the concerns of those people who are worried that uh, only uh, high income homeowners are gonna be able to afford these. I do think we're gonna have to work for programs to make sure that middle and um, lower income people can afford to do this. And that's also going to affect obviously the affordability of the units. Um, as far as any kind of restriction, whether it's by time 
or owner occupancy or anything, those are going, though any kind of restriction, a sunset clause is going to make these, these affordable, uh, I'm sorry, accessory dwelling units completely unaffordable because no one's going to finance them. So if we want to increase affordability of housing, we have to make sure that we use our existing uh, zoning requirements and don't add any additional restrictions for these um, for these uh, accessory dwelling units, such as owner occupancy. You can live in a multi-generational situation without having children or parents. You might decide that a student at the university allows you to age in place in your residence, or it may be that you will move into an accessory dwelling unit with people to whom you are not related, but will offer the kind of um, support that parents and older folks generally give to their children or their neighbors. So for that reason, I really hope that we pass this. And I just wanted to thank Daniel for all the hard work he's done on this. I've seen his presentations before and they've really been remarkably helpful and comprehensive. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker is Joe Adino. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, I also want to thank the commission and Mr. Bersick for adding me for the list and for that great presentation. Um, my name is Joe Adino. I live at 2714 East Winchester Vista in Barrio Centro. Um, I've been, I think, as loud as just about anybody in Tucson the last few years about our issues around housing, affordability, eviction, and displacement. And uh, like some of our early, earlier commenters, I want to say that I, fa I, I favor ADUs in, in principle. I like the concept of it, but I have reservations. Um, about this ordinance, especially regarding some of the occupancy things. I hear the um, concerns about absentee landlords without any owner occupancy rules. That does sound like it could be an issue. Uh, but my main objection is um, kind of the timing of this, because as Mr. Bursick noted, uh, the state of Arizona limits short term rental regulations. Um, so my concerns about that are that ADUs and even the potential to build ADUs on a lot of lots um, and the potential of those to become short-term rentals may increase value of housing and thus put possible housing options out of reach for lots of two zones. Uh, that wouldn't put them out of the reach of institutional investors though. And the bigger issue also is that there just isn't any guarantee that any ADUs become housing, much less affordable housing. Since we can't regulate short-term rentals, these could, uh, this could be a preponderance of Airbnbs and could lead to situations where you have single family rentals with an Airbnb or two short-term rental parcels in the hands of investors. That's a big concern for me. Um, I know a lot of other people have said that. My, one of my big revelations regarding housing in 2021 has been that there are big real estate investors that are also large shareholders in Airbnb and short-term rental operators. One example is Graystar who I believe will be the owner of eight Tucson apartment complexes next month as the, uni the union on sixth opens. Um, they're a big shareholder in Airbnb. And I have heard reports of Graystar um, raising rents on people. And then if people have to move out, they don't fill those rental units necessarily. They put those out as short-term rentals, uh, Airbnbs effectively. So, um, yeah, that's one of my concerns is that is that, you know, uh, if institutional investors do end up buying this, these up that uh, via short term rental additions, this could take some housing off of the market, not really add it. Um, so to, to sum up, you know, if, if next year we elect a different Arizona legislature, they put their heads out of their rears and they let cities add some regulations around short term rentals, I think I would be in favor of this ordinance. But because that's not where we are right now, I think um, I hear the concerns of our midtown neighborhoods and I think those are warranted. I'd love to see regulation of short-term rentals. And I think if we move forward to that, uh, an ADU ordinance would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is David Walker. Okay, um, at this time, I'd like to uh, invite anybody that's on in the audience um, 
to, would like to speak to uh, let us know by raising your hand. Yeah, Commissioner Martin, I believe you missed Laura on the uh, on your list. Oh, I'm sorry, Laura. Kabili. Thank you. Um, yes, I want. Uh, so I um, one one six North Mountain Avenue eight five seven one nine. Um, I live near the university, and um, oh, so I need to say I'm in favor of ADUs for the stated reasons. Um, to enhance affordable housing, to allow family support for people to age in place, to densify our, our and make more walkable our city in, in the face of this climate crisis that we're facing and indeed a housing crisis as several people have eloquently said. I do have some concerns about loopholes in the ordinance and I think other people have brought those up too. So I'll try to make it brief. But I do want to say I live near the university, and those those of us who do know that uh, near university neighborhoods have been the canaries in the coal mine for every kind of inappropriate development that can exploit a loophole in the existing uh, legislation, and that is why I foresee problems. Uh, that could be corrected and should be corrected so that we can have ADUs and we can have a bigger supply of affordable housing. Um, so the first thing is that I really think uh, that um, some type of residence requirement needs to be in place. The one that Lee Marsh suggested sounds not too onerous so that indeed this is family housing. Uh, the, re the requirement doesn't mean that both units have to be owner occupied, but it means that one or the other need to be owner occupied. If not, uh, just exactly the concern that the previous speaker raised, which is that spec you know, predatory speculators just come in and vacuum up all these uh, ADUs or build a vacuum up, which they do in our neighbor in our near university neighborhoods, and it sounds like they're going further afield now. They just vacuum up all the, uh, you know, any property that's for sale, and then they uh, proceed to build something really inappropriate and charge predatory rents for it, and that doesn't remedy the problem of affordable housing, and so whether it's a residency requirement or whether it's some other type of uh, measure that the city can take, given that the legislature has really tied the city's hands. Something has to be done to keep those ADUs affordable so that they don't just pass into the general rental market. Because what people are talking about is, yes, people who have a place to live and then the rent skyrockets and they're homeless. Well, another expensive dwelling unit is not going to solve their problem, right? We need affordable housing. And when we're talking about affordability, I agree with Commissioner Fink, we have to talk about Section 8 people who are on Section 8 who can't pay more than about $800 a month, which brings me to my second point, and that is 1,000 square feet is excessively large for an accessory dwelling unit. None of the pictures that we saw in the presentation of ADUs were anywhere near a thousand square feet. In fact, my neighborhood is full of little guest houses because it was built before 1948 and they're little. Housing advocates, and there are some in the, there are some here so they can correct me, but my understanding is housing advocates say that uh, to be affordable, a dwelling unit needs to be between 300 and say 700 square feet, right? And that would also limit the number of people living in it. So you don't end up with so many people who need so much parking because another issue, and I totally agree with the person who's concerned about the tree canopy, is that when you get a front house and a back house, and I speak from experience, all the mature trees get cut down in order to make a room for that excessively large uh, dwelling unit. And therefore the front yard becomes a parking lot and there go 
all, there goes all the vegetation. And instead of remedying the heat island effect, it exacerbates it in addition to looking like heck when you have five cars parked in the front yard of a house. Um, so a thousand square feet, I think really needs to be rethought. Uh, my house, my three bedroom house is approximately that size. And it's, uh, and it's too big. When I retire, I'm gonna downsize. So my point <laughs> to reiterate, uh, some kind of control has to be placed on these, whether it's a residency requirement or something else, so that they remain affordable, right? Or else the, the, the stated purpose of affordable housing will not be served. And secondly, a thousand square feet is too large. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, with that, um, Daniel brought up the issue of continuing the public hearing. Um, I guess I would ask the commissioners if um, what their thoughts on, are on that before we move to close the public hearing. Any thoughts? Hearing none. Uh, oh, I, yeah, Commissioner Martin, or uh, uh, Nicholas Pat, or Commissioner Pafford has uh, his hand uh, up. He, okay, he's sorry. Raising a yeah. physical hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, I. He's I, not I, on my screen right now. So. Um, I would be in favor of continuing the public hearing. I don't know how anyone else feels. So, any, any discussion on this, uh, Commissioner McBride? Yeah. I, I, I feel like there's some, some more things we should be asking for, and I don't feel very comfortable closing the public hearing right now. The issue is, if we close the public hearing, we have to reopen it. It has to be re-advertised, and we run into an issue with the time constraint. So any other comment from commissioners? I just have a question. Uh, have we seen any increase in uh, engagement from the public, uh, in, you know, through this process? Because it, it doesn't feel like there's been an increase in engagement. Um, so what would be the, the goal of extending the public hearing? So Commissioner Lucia, um, one, one of the, um, the issues was just the fact that there was concern that because it's the summer, um, there are people who are out of town or on vacation or gone that wouldn't weren't able to um, to attend this meeting and be able to speak. So they wouldn't be heard um, before you would make your decision. So that that was that was one of the concerns related to that. We've seen a bit of an uptick since the study session. Um, I think we're getting out a little more and things of that sort. Um, not not a huge amount, but there has been some. Wouldn't a virtual hearing be more accessible to those out of town that care about this issue as opposed to less accessible though? Like the argument that, that we have less people here with, with COVID restrictions, in fact, it, it should be more accessible to those that are out of town. Having just returned from being out of town, I can tell you there, I, had, I ran into significant connectivity problems being out of town. Fair enough. Uh, uh Daniel, could you tell us what date you think it would be continued to if we continued it? Um, we would be looking at continuing it to the September 1st date. Um, that would get you out of the summer period where people would be back and, and settled and be able to uh, attend that meeting. Mr. Tafford, did you wanna make that a motion or? Uh, yes, I would like to motion that we continue the public hearing until September um, uh, 1st. Day. This is September 1st, yes, thank you. Is there a second? A second. Can I ask a question before we vote on that? Yes, you may. Would there be any more outreach um, done by the city in the meantime, or we would, would we just expecting, you know, what's currently happening to continue? 
Daniel? Or Corin, I, 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 if you would Sorry, like to. So, it, yeah, um, Commissioner Ortiz Pino, um, I think we would use mostly um, some online methods of communication. We can send out some emails to, we've already sent um, several emails to all neighborhood associations. So, we would continue to do that. Um, and let people know this has been continued and what the avenues are for further input. Um, so making people aware of the online survey and the opportunity to submit written comment or attend the next public hearing. So I read in one of the comments, you know, my suggestion would be to, you know, maybe get the news, local news to give a plug that makes it more widely available, makes it, brings it out, would that be an option? Yes, definitely. And actually, um, Commissioner, there's a few news outlets that we believe will be covering tonight's hearing. So there should be some additional coverage in the next couple of days. I also have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, to kind of follow this a little bit more, if we get more public comments than we already have, and there's been a, a fairly robust public participation process up to this point, in my opinion, if we get lots more comments, is staff going to go back and make changes? Because at the end of the day, if this is kind of what we're going to get and they're not going to be major changes to what is before us, I, it's hard for me to see why we would continue the public comment period and, and keep this open. Commissioner, um, I think that we are also looking for guidance from the Planning Commission on those potential changes. So it is possible that additional comments um, could influence the proposal before you, um, but we would also want to um, hear from the Planning Commission. So if I may, um, Chair Martin, I wonder, and maybe Piri can weigh in here, um, Piri, would they be able to have some discussion before they make a decision on closing the hearing or continuing it? I'm not sure that we have Hi. period. Just oh. oh, there she is. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Piri Glinsky with the city attorney's office. Is the question whether or not there would be further discussion at the next continued? So, hearing? actually, what I was just thinking was, um, I was just wondering if the commission could actually have further discussion amongst themselves about the merits of the proposal and any maybe further questions or recommendations they have before they make a decision on closing the hearing or continuing the hearing? At this point, um, in if, if a motion is made to continue the hearing, it should just be pertinent to that. Um, I, um, I guess I had a question for staff about what becomes a principal use if the ADU is larger than the principal use on the property? I tried to look at definitions of principal and accessory use, and um, I think I need clarification on that. Um, and that's why I would, you know, look at uh, maybe a continuance. Um, the other issue was the owner occupancy issue that was brought up that I could see being studied a little bit more and uh, by staff. So any other discussion? Or? Yeah, I, uh, this is Thomas. I, um, I, September 1st is before Labor Day, I would suggest you do the one, uh, the alternate date after Labor Day, because if they're away during the summer, they're going to be away through Labor Day, I would think. Any other commissioners have I, comments? I just, I just have a comment, and that's that, you know, I, I feel like we, we've heard some positive reactions tonight, but also some some negatives and, and I'm, I understand that there's a lot of, there seem to be a lot of 
online positive reactions, but the written comments that we've seen are like 95% negative on this. And it seems like there's more things that need to be looked at a bit. And I'm just feeling like it's going to do more harm than good right now if we close the public hearing. It's, 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 it, it, I, I don't see a compelling reason to not, uh, to, I'm sorry, to, cl to close it right now. Any other commissioners? I have it. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I, I was merely going to say that, it, at least for, for me, I would like the opportunity to hear more um, input from the public and different perspectives to influence how I'm going to vote. So I welcome the opportunity to give more, more people to speak, and that, that's why I would like to continue it. Was it, was it Commissioner Cassidy? Was that uh, yes, thank you, Chairman Martin. I would be okay with continuing it. I have a couple of questions uh, about um, some of the concerns that some of the speakers brought up. I really appreciate all the people who came out tonight and spent their time with us to share their opinions. Um, so there's a couple of things that I would like for staff to consider and provide some answers on before we vote on this matter. And the other concern that I have is that the commission rules still don't allow a second motion after a motion has failed. And this is such an important issue. I really don't want us to end up having to send a non-recommendation to the council. So if there's any way for the commission during the subsequent public hearing to do some straw polling or maybe um, throw some ideas around as to who would support what and come up with some kind of uh, agreement between us. Um, not behind the scenes, obviously, in a public forum, but I really don't want to see another failed motion like we had with one of the recent public hearings that we held. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Uh, Chuck? Yes, Mark. Um, one, thank you, Commissioner Cassidy. I think that was a great comment um, about our bylaws. I mean, just an aside, since I was chair, which was like three years ago, I've been trying to get our bylaws changed. And while I've always been promised it'll occur, it hasn't yet. So I think that's really important. I'm not sure it could be done in time before our next hearing, which unfortunately I'll be out of town for. Um, but one way, we might have to deal with it is if there's if it appears like there's more than one viewpoint is to deal with the whole issue of substitute motions um, that I raised either last session or a couple of sessions ago where if someone makes a motion but there appears to be other opinions you can make a substitute motion and if it's seconded and it's failed the original motion will at least be voted on but I do share your concern that I don't want to send something. I don't want us to send something without a recommendation. It's just absurd. Um, I would also say, just in terms of, of comments, um, I think size is an issue. But I think what also kind of bothers me, and I'm a big support. I support the idea of accessory develop um, accessory dwellings. Um, I've always seen it in terms of granny flats or mother-in-law flats or such which are, are generally smaller. And my fear is, is that um, we're trying to do too much with this one ordinance and we need to be more focused. And it may be better to just focus on a couple of things and come back later and do more. And I also share the concern of one of the speakers who said that if we won't be able to make this more restrictive down the road. It's not like the discussion we had with medical marijuana where some people felt that um, we could always make it less restrictive. This one, I think the issue is going to be making it more restrictive and that's legally more difficult to do. And again, the whole issue of affordable housing, it's all over the place and we need to be more focused. I, I mean, I'm a big advocate of affordable housing um, when I worked for the county, I tw twice I tried to get inclusionary zoning adopted by the county. Um, but 
we need to be focused on what we're trying to achieve. Just merely to say it's going to be um, less unaffordable is not the same thing as talking about really truly affordable housing. So um, with that, um, I'm fine. If, if people want to continue, that's fine with me. Thank you. Any other, any other commissioners? It's Chairman Here. Martin. It's yes. Anna again. Um, I just wanted to say that I support Commissioner Sailor Brown's thoughts on avoiding Labor Day and pushing the continuance to mid September. I think the motion on the table is to uh, continue it to September 1st. I guess if that's a friendly amendment, but yes, I'd like to make a friendly amendment to the motion, if I may. Is that okay with the motion maker? Well, that was a suggestion of mine. I don't know if I'm a motion make, maker. Uh, I'm a motion maker. Mr. Pafford. It's fine with me. Yes, thank you. And who the second? Who seconded? I, I second it. I, it's fine. That's fine with me. So the motion is to continue the public hearing until September 15th. Is that the correct date, Daniel? Uh, you know, Chair Martin, yes, that is uh, that is the correct date. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those in favor, say nay. <laughs> all those opposed, say nay. I, I mean, all, so all those opposed, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Hearing none, should we do a roll, uh, roll call or just for, or is it unanimous? I think it was unanimous. I think we're okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so good to see everybody in uh, September, I guess. So oh, um, this is Piri again. Um, it, Commissioner, um, Chair Martin, if you could just for the record, please restate when the hearing will be continued to and um, where it will be held. Okay. So the hearing on the accessory dwelling unit text, hearing on the accessory dwelling unit text amendment, public hearing is continued to September 15th um, at 6 p.m. at the alternate commission meeting. I assume we'll still be meeting uh, Using Zoom. Thank you. Oh, that's a Sunday, isn't it? No, sorry, never mind. Uh, next item on the agenda is staff announcements. Chair Martin, do you want any further discussion on that item? On um, accessory dwellings? I think that was to close, to continue the hearing, but did, we just want to check to see if there's any other guidance or input or if all the commissioners have shared your feedback. If any commissioners have any other items that they would like staff to look at for the next public hearing? I'm, I'm guess I'm confused. I was thinking that would be discussion that we weren't supposed to be having. That was after the vote, I guess, if okay. So, Chair Martin, this is Commissioner Cassidy. Am I allowed to um, tell staff what my specific concerns would be that I'd be looking for more information on at the next public hearing? Is this an appropriate time? I believe so. Okay, well, I'll go ahead then. In listening to some of the public speakers, some of the questions that came to my mind that I'd like a little more information on was that thousand square foot maximum for the larger lots. Is there a specific reason for the thousand square foot and what would the harm be if it was 750 across the board? The second question that I had was um, one of the speakers mentioned that if there was a sunset clause that financing would be difficult or impossible. And I'm curious about that, whether that's accurate or not. Um, and also, 
I guess that's about it. Those are my main things. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Staff announcements. Any announcements from staff? Uh, I, court. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we have any announcements um, other than, you know, that there will be uh, this continued hearing. There's no news on going back to in-person meeting? No, um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you to all of the commissioners who responded to our survey regarding um, virtual meetings um, versus in-person meetings. It was great to get your input as well as input from other commissioners. So we are considering all of that as we kind of develop an approach to not just planning commission, but other board and commission meetings going forward and really public engagement in general um, as we move forward. So I think one of the things a few of you brought up as you were discussing you know, this public hearing and continuing is sort of what has been the impact of virtual meetings on engagement. And interestingly, we think that it's actually led to a lot of increased participation and greater attendance at some of our public meetings that previously, um, you know, we might not have seen such widespread attendance, but we've seen really strong turnout at a lot of our virtual meetings. Um, that being said, we're also looking for ways to continue or go back to in-person meetings because we know that virtual meetings are not accessible to a certain slice of our community. So we're looking to really do both, but um, I think that some form of virtual engagement is really here to stay and something that our many members of our community really appreciate and um, and have learned how to, to utilize quite well. Thank you. Next item is future agenda item. Staff, um, please provide commission with upcoming items. Sure, uh, yeah, Chair Martin, commission. Um, as of now, we have the one item, which is the, uh, uh, the public hearing for, the continued public hearing for the accessory dwelling units on September 15th. Um, moving forward with that, um, we will take uh, the suggestion into account related to the bylaws as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is call the audience. And um, um, Chuck, sorry. Um, yeah, if I may, before you call to the audience, I have one request for a future agenda item, which I just touched on, and I think Commissioner Cassidy did too. Um, We've talked about for two or three years, making some changes to our bylaws and our rules. Um, and staff has consistently said, yes, we're, we'll bring it to you soon. Um, it's longer than soon. And we can see that it's become problematic. And I don't think it would be that hard to deal with it. I mean, two of the issues are how we do votes. Um, so for instance, the county's planning and zoning commission they do votes, they'll do enough motions until they get a recommendation to send to the Board of Supervisors. They don't have the, the silly rule that we have about we have one vote and we're done. And I don't think that would be that hard to deal with. Another one is the rule about um, what constitutes a recommendation right now. Um, you have to have at least seven votes for it to be forwarded as a recommendation of the commission. That's absurd. Um, again, the county doesn't do that. It's the majority of whomever showed up at the meeting. So I think we should deal with that. And it seems like that could be something could be drawn up really quickly. I understand staff is overworked, but I don't think it would take more than half hour, an hour to, to draw up something for us to consider as it's changed to our bylaws, and I think it would make a big difference. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fink. Next item is call the audience. Um, for anyone that would like to speak on anything that's not on tonight's agenda, since we just had a public hearing, um, I guess raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, uh, next item is adjournment.
I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second from Cassidy. Thank you. Any dis any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Thank you everyone for spending the evening with us. Um, we'll see you back on September 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Have a nice night. Thank you, everyone.